Welcome to the 2018 ABLE Ignite. Um, we've done everything we can do to, see, to make sure the technology will work. Thanks to Sean. Thank you very much, Sean. So, so we'll see how it goes. OK. All right, so how we're gonna, how this is gonna work, as you uh, may uh, know, these uh, Ignite sessions that have been organized and led by uh, Kate Coleman from the University of Melbourne. Uh, we've had them the last couple of years uh, at ABLE. They're, they're fun to watch. There's something unexpected <laughs> that happens every time, so we'll see you know, how it goes today. Uh, Kate really is the mastermind, as well as the coach, uh, for the ABLE uh, Ignite sessions, and you know, she's the one that kind of compiles everything and puts it all together and uh, I'm here to be sort of just the on-site person. Um, what I'm, how we're going to start today is actually with a recording from uh, uh, Deidre Tyler from Salt Lake Community College. She unfortunately couldn't uh, join us in person and everything, but did send a video, so I'm going to go ahead and play that first, and then we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the rest of the, uh, the Ignites. Gold mining and the e-portfolio. How is the e-portfolio like gold mining? In my social problems class, I have students to decide on a social problem. Yes, zone in on a social problem for the entire semester. Students are well equipped. They're searching for the gold. As ePortfolio Gold Miners, we have got to have all of our equipment, computers, cell phones, iPads, and a good learning management system. With that in place, we're now ready to go. We are looking and searching. I tell my students, look at social media. Look at social media and social media can help you with a topic. You're a gold miner. You're looking for trends. You're looking for things that are very interesting. You're searching Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and you're finding what people are talking about. You're searching for the gold using social media. Yes, you need to pan. With all the information that is embarking our students and instructors on this social media, we must step back and tell our students to pan that information. Yes, good gold miners use a pan to shake up all the debris away. They're going back and forth and swiveling that pan to make sure all the dirt and rocks are out of that pan. And I tell my students, before you do your assignment, step back. Look to see if you're summarizing the article correctly. Look to see if you have a good topic, submit your draft to me, and I will pan and make sure you're on the right track. I will make sure all the unnecessary, unrelated information is not in this pan. The ePortfolio is almost ready. We're searching for the gold. Students, the gold is in the ePortfolio. Yes, we're now searching more. And as instructors, we are leading that group with our metal detector. Yes, we can find the goal with the metal detector. And once we find that goal, everybody is so happy. We need to now reflect on this goal. How did you decide on the topic? Where did you find this research? What did you learn from the process of finding this goal? Reflect on the goal with other people. Join up together and collaborate on the process of how you found this goal. What does the gold mining expert say about this specific problem? Reflect on what that ex expert is saying by following this expert on Twitter. After you follow this expert on Twitter, reflect on what you learned from that expert. Now it's time to showcase your goal. My face-to-face -face students are showcasing the goal in class, but my online students are showcasing their goal using WebEx. Oh, we're sharing the goal. Now it's time for the faculty members to decide on whether or not that student's goal is legitimate. The high impact practice is done by making sure all people involved know what's going on. Is this real goal? Something about that e-portfolio high-impact practice? Well, it's something good in finding a good e-portfolio. We're now happy to find it because the rubric tells us we have real goal. And the signature assignments can be in many different tasks. 
Now, what are we learning? We're learning about outcomes. What does that minor learn as a result of trial and error? They know that the teacher's there leading the expedition, and they know that that teacher is going to help them find that goal. We know that we need to focus on our mining, not just for one section of the United States, but for the entire United States. We want to include more. What does success look like? After we have found that goal, that student has a higher GPA, their retention is higher, and they graduate as a result of the ePortfolio. We have found the goal. I'm teaching students every day to find the goal. Congratulations to all ePortfolio practitioners. We have found the goal. Thank you. Okay, great. So now we're going to go ahead and move forward with uh, Mark uh, Corbett Wilson. And also, uh, before, again, just to again, recap, it's, um, let's see, 20 slides, 15 seconds each, self-advancing. Once we start it, we're not stopping it. It's just going to keep on going. <laughs> we think, we think, fingers crossed. And again, and again, I just want to briefly also uh, acknowledge and thank uh, Christina Hoffner, who's actually been helping us uh, both record, you know, the keynotes as well as the Ignites. It's our plan to help to make these available uh, after the conference as a resource. I know there's so many great things being said that it's hard to process in the moment. So to give you an opportunity to also be able to view those uh, presentations again and and uh, reflect on them. So thank you again so much, Christina. Okay, so with that, here we go. It's gonna go. It's gonna go. Okay. I hope. Hi, I'm Mark Corbett Wilson. I'm a student at uh, Metropolitan State University in St. Paul, Minnesota, and is it going? No. I'll just keep talking till it starts. <laughs> and I'm using my ePortfolio. Uh, I'm the first student they've authorized to use my ePortfolio on my own domain uh, for prior learning assessment for degree credit. So uh, it's kind of an experiment they're doing, and they're hoping to open up uh, prior learning assessment beyond their own system. OK, so because it's such a um, just thing to do. I do want to acknowledge the unceded territory of the Salish, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tslay Watuth peoples where we're gathered here today. I'm bringing this to uh, Berkeley, California and trying to institute that uh, across the institutions where I uh, hang out. Then I also want to congratulate Capilano University on their 50th anniversary. What a beautiful place, huh? Really, really nice. So, um, as I said, I'm um, a student and I use my ePortfolio um, in public to, to do classwork in public and to document uh, a lifetime and life-wide experiences. Um, it all starts with Unix and free and open source software, um, but now we're to the point where we call it open education. I had a definition from Spark, I guess that's gone, good. Um, everybody knows about open education resources, and I hope that you know about David Wiley's five R's that uh, of reuse, and I can never remember them all when I need to. But um, and that leads us to open content, uh, where I've spent some time on the net with uh, network narratives out of Keene University. I don't know if you're familiar with that, so something that Alan Levine has put together. And uh, open pedagogy, which um, uh, Reclaim Hosting is the, the originator, I guess, or at least the host of the domain of one's own idea, uh, where you do your learning in public. And DS106 is a great place to practice your digital skills. Uh, the term I like to use is hodagogy, which is adult self-directed learning. Um, uh, it's kind of the newer term from open pedagogy. Um, where am I? <laughs> Can't see the screen. Um, so, Metropolitan State University was a former university without walls, 
and uh, that was my that was my e-portfolio, wasn't it? Um, where they're still using, uh, still doing um, individualized studies uh, for adult learners. There it is. Okay. So I, I try to use my portfolio for all kinds of things, um, as you can see, uh, because I, I'm retired from one career and moving into education. So um, the College of Individualized Studies is a place where adults can finish degrees uh, that have you know, prior education experience. Um, on my e-portfolio, I've got a lot of my digital projects from these different open um, learning environments, DS106 and other projects. And then I put up some of my classwork as well. Uh, so uh, my point on, on all this is that uh, I'm trying to build an open platform for self-directed adult learners so that they can uh, demonstrate their learning, whether it's to uh, their boss or an institution to get prior credit for their learning. And I uh, have been using digital tools. That was a geography project that I finished my associate's degree with. And this is a demonstration of uh, my lifetime career as a glass blower and glass artist, um, which is in the rearview mirror now. So, but I still, write about that on my blog as well. Um, one of my interests is building an ontology here at ABLE um, that's a controlled vocabulary so that we can tag all of our projects so that they can be found on the semantic web. This project will help both us to organize our database of our learning and to look for patterns and new connections that we would ordinarily see and also allow us to find other learners and researchers and educators on the semantic web using the same controlled vocabulary. And there'll be more about that during the next couple of days, especially at the special interest group for practices and pedagogies, which I encourage everybody to come and say hi. Thank you very much. Good. And all right, hi, we're going. I'm Sarah Brown, and I'm the Assistant Director for Faculty Development and Instructional Technology at DePaul University. With my five minutes, I want to talk about something I tried in my first year writing courses this past year, revising a reflective prompt to integrate multimodality. So last year at ABLE, I gave an Ignite presentation, because I'm nuts, um, that focused on attended images, images that support the information shared in text, but that aren't necessarily meaning-making standing by themselves, as a methodology for scaffolding multimodal practice in students' digital portfolios. And I'm still not above pandering with cute anim animal images. This year, it's a tiny turtle eating a tiny strawberry, which hopefully just gave you a nice little serotonin shot to get your brains ready for the rest of the presentation. Um, and so for this year's Ignite session, I wanted to share what I found when I asked students to incorporate multimodal elements in the reflective element of the final portfolio in my course. In making this change, I used three primary articles to frame the revision. So of course, I started with Kathy Yancey. Where else do you start? Um, talked about productivism, you get 15 seconds. Uh, I was looking at this article where she wrote a little bit about print work and digital work and coherence and looking at past towards assessment heuristics. And I was feeling like, not having multimodality built into my reflection was a lack of coherence. Then I looked a little bit at Michael John De Palma and Kara Paul Alexander, who write a little bit more broadly about students' multimodal composing processes. And what struck me is that I was thinking about this, the reflection as a low stakes space, but wasn't scaffolding it um, appropriately. And then looked a little bit further back for some foundational pieces on reflection. Sharon Pianco's 1979 article was a good reminder and sort of problematized this binary I was struggling with around low stakes and um, high being mission, being mission critical. Um, so with those three pieces in mind, I set out to revise the reflection prompt that I've been using in this final portfolio for um, this freshman composition class, which I've been teaching in an online format 
uh, for the last three years. So here's the original prompt. It's based on um, Jody Shipka's um, piece, um, looking through the uh, methodologies that students use when composing. So I'm asking them to do something a little bit different than some other reflection pieces they might have done in the past. I want them to think about, in their, in their reflection, talk about what they did rhetorically. I wanted them to talk about the materiality that they took advantage of, um, what they used to craft their ar argument and what affordances were available to them. I want to think about the methodologies that they implemented, um, thinking strategically, thinking about the technologies that they used and to what effect, what were their goals, what were the outcomes of using those technologies. Um, and overall, how did their choices impact the argument that they ended up producing in their portfolio? So the addition that I made in the last two quarters was just to sort of say, it's also multimodal. Like, think about it the way you're thinking the rest of your portfolio. I wanted, again, I'm sort of struggling with this. I wanted to feel low stakes, um, but also feel still mission critical. So trying to look at what the outcomes were. Did they write more or less? Well. I don't know, not really. It's kind of not very, I mean, it's only four quarters worth, so not really a good indicator there on quantity. Um, so then I moved towards looking at quality. So if I looked at their full portfolio grade, which was out of 100, you can see that there's a slight uptick in the two, port, two quarters where the multimodal um, reflection was used. But as you'll see on the next slide, I don't think the multimodality of the reflection was, was um, a key factor there because the grade for that element out of the rubric didn't really change. Um, and the whole impetus for this was that I always felt like this was in the rubric coming out as the weakest link for their overall grade, and so that's why I wanted to try tackling it with something different. So I am back to the drawing board a little bit, because this mini experiment to see if it was something to continue pursuing didn't really give me the results that I was looking for. Um, as far as seeing a, a general shift in portfolios. I did have a couple of successes to, to point to. Here's a student who was using a newspaper metaphor in her portfolio overall, and then when she um, added that metaphorical element to her reflection, I thought it was just a nice cohesion across. Here's a student who um, had made a BuzzFeed style listicle for her argument, and then for her reflection, she formatted um, it, it like a comments page at the bottom of a BuzzFeed article with me as the author of the questions she was responding to. So what next? Um, do I revise the prompt again? Do I add more scaffolding for reflection? Do I have to scrap it all and start over? I don't know. Um, that's what next year is for. Uh, but if you have thoughts or have ideas or want to talk to me more about it, I would invite further conversation and here's how you can find me. Thanks. Hi, I'm Samantha Blevins. I'm back at Radford University. I'm an instructional designer and learning architect is my official new title. Um, and when my next slide happens, we'll get started. So I am the maybe fearless, maybe not leader for the technology SIG um, for ABLE. And that's what I'm going to spend the next couple slides talking about. I cheated. I only have nine. <laughs> Um, not the 20 that I was allotted. Um, and so when I was tasked with this, I decided, okay, well, we have to figure out who we are um, as the technology SIG and kind of figure out where we want to go. And so um, last year we got together as a group. Um, there, it was a small group of us. And we talked about who we were, what our makeup was um, in terms of our interests and why we were interested within the SIG. Um, and um, the, so we're, we're members of the, the ABLE community. My slides were changed. I may have 20. <laughs> so we're all members of the ABLE community, pretty active members of the ABLE community, and really excited about um, our topic. We were interested in current technology within, the, uh, within ABLE um, and what that looks like, what it's looked like in the past, of course, and kind of where it's headed in the future. Um, and then in terms of um, future technology and current technology, how we can, can leverage that um, to make really great e-portfolios, really high impact practice e-portfolios for our students. Um, so to do that, we had to reflect on our past, of course, because it's e-portfolio, so why not? I think I stole this from Helen Chen. It was on Google <laughs> from a past conference. 
Um, but so we had to reflect on our past before we can really plan the future of what technology should look like and what we hope it will look like. Um, and so how did we get there? We had that common interest and um, we had a desire to support exemplar e-portfolios and we had an interest in um, looking at it. So in terms of the future, I have no idea what slide's coming next. <laughs> um, in terms of the future, what we're hoping to accomplish um, this year um, are a couple of things. And the first one is the current technology uh, landscape for ePortfolio. What do we have out there? What's on maybe the horizon just a little bit? Um, how can we kind of bend that and make it do what we want it to do? Um, we also are interested in envisioning what the ideal platform might look like, uh, which I think is a really interesting notion that we are interested um, in kind of diving down deeper into. And the other thing that we feel like is essential is that we want to partner with platform vendors um, to make sure that they're part of the conversation um, and that we're, we all have kind of a, a seat at the table so that we can talk to each other and forge new technology territories with them. Um, and so hopefully we're going to make this happen <laughs> um, and within at least make a couple of steps this year um, toward these big goals. So the first one would be to have to start compiling some official SIG documentation on uh, what's out there, what those features are in terms of the technology landscape, um, what's good, what's bad, what needs work. Um, and we want, we want everybody to have a seat at the table and have a voice. Um, so we're going to look at current platforms and features. <laughs> um, and then we're going to look at effective technology implementation, which is a huge conversation. And technology is a big part of the implementation process. Um, and so we want to make sure that is part of the conversation as well. And then we're going to look at that ideal platform um, and uh, what we really think could make great e-portfolios even better. So I hope that you'll join us. The meeting is tomorrow um, in the afternoon. Um, we also have an online Google group and the, the link will flash up here in a second. And um, I'm hoping to have a monthly meetup the second Tuesdays of each month, 2 to 3 Eastern. The first one will be September 11th. If that doesn't work, we'll go back to the drawing board and find something that will work for everyone. And my slides changed, but um, the original ones <laughs> were inspired by uh, Glow. <laughs> if you haven't seen Glow on Netflix, you should definitely check it out. It's a really fun show. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cindy Stevens. I am the co-executive editor of AEPR, ABLE's ePortfolio Review, and I have three other team members with me today. I have Candace, I have Samantha, and I have Adam. And uh, we are here representing uh, ABLE's ePortfolio Journal. This is our entire team. Several of our members couldn't be here today, but just to point out a few, you know, Dave, everybody knows Dave from Alaska, right? <clears throat> And um, we have Nami, who is our uh, layout and design person. We couldn't do this without her. She's incredible. And AEPR, we are an uh, online ePortfolio publication. We're here to serve the needs of the ePortfolio community globally. And we're a different type of publication. We really uh, want practitioners' work, scholarly work. And we have different types of articles, short and long. And we have a really a different process with all this. Tracy alluded to this earlier. Um, even though we're not a double-blind peer-reviewed journal, we do have a heavy-duty review process. Like we pair you with a review editor, and we also go through several several iterations of review through APA review and other types of review. And you'll notice that the design of the slides is up there now. This is one of our previous issues, and this is another one now. You look at the nice covers, a nice focus on a specific thing at one point, high impact practices for this one. 
Uh, and Nami does a great job with designing this so that it comes out and makes it just a pleasure to look at while you're reading as well. And some examples of that are the next few slides, one being the layout that we have for specific articles. This is a title page where you can see what else is coming in the contents. You can click on any one of these and get to that article that you're trying to look at. Um, you can also see that the, it looks almost like a magazine article where it has the two columns and runs and just has um, a good way to move through the article and it's easy to view, easy to look at. Uh, each, one of the slide, each one of the articles also has um, just pulled out quotes so you can flip through the article if you want to because I know all of us read every article that's ever published in our field. And now you can look at the quotes and see what, whether or not you want to focus on the rest of this article. Is it something that's interesting to you? Is it not? Um, and then it has like a nice way to put in the tables and the questions and other things that people use while they're talking about the article. You can grab those and put them in and see them without having to disrupt the reading process and skip down to what goes next instead of go to the final thing. And the way we do this is through multiple tools of technology because we are all in different places from Alaska all the way to Boston and then, where is Nami? Is that a, a long way away? So we use, uh, we use Zoom, we use Slack, we use Airtable, Nami uses InDesign, the rest of us aren't allowed to touch that. Um, <laughs> because Nami does things like figure refinement where if an author sends a figure that goes off the page or doesn't work the way it's supposed to, we can say, okay, this is how we're gonna redesign this just slightly so that it looks readable at A and then also just um, important to what you're talking about. Okay, and that was my little chart, so I was really appreciative of Nami doing that. <laughs> um, and this is just an example, AEPRs everywhere. Uh, this is an example of an author who um, provided some information about her study that appeared in AEPR. Um, we have an online present, obviously we're an online um, journal, but also uh, we have a presence in social media, so please make sure you talk to me if you'd like to get the link to our Facebook and our Twitter, etc. And um, also submissions, we have two issues a year, and we invite you to share your practices. There's been many things I've already heard that I'd love to have in our journal. Uh, and this is our webpage, our, the rest of our um, again, got updated at the same time that the web page got updated. So again, look for us. So in terms of presence, we totally understand, know that there are other journals out there um, and, that, uh, and that we are kind of within this field of um, wonderful publishing. So we have International IGEP, um, <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we also have Educational <laughs> Technology Research and Development, a really fantastic journal for instructional design, and a new journal we learned about when we presented a couple of months ago in Dublin, Rapport. Um, and so, but we would love to hear your feedback about our process. We're going to be at a um, poster session in a little bit. Uh, I hear there will be snacks and drinks. Grown-up drinks, maybe, but for <laughs> Um, and so we would love to hear your feedback about our process, what you think of us when you look at um, our magazine, our journal, um, and how you think we can be better because we are your journal and we're a reflection um, of you. So thank you. Ooh, what a good relief. I can see my slides. I heard that I couldn't. I'm Dwayne Harapnik. Uh, my partner, Tosa Thibodeau, wasn't able to be here today, so uh, she's here in spirit. Focus. I want you to consider focus today. Where are you looking? Where is your focus? The reason this is important is that I want you to think of focus in the context of where is it taking you? More specifically, I'm going to suggest that if you have a slight change in your focus, you might be able to really get where you want to go with your ePortfolio initiative. Just a slight change of focus. And I'm going to hopefully make that argument for you today. If we listen to Alvin Toffler, he makes a suggestion. You've got to think about the big things while you're doing the small things so that the small things go in the right direction. Going in the right direction is important with your educational plans for the ePortfolio, but it's also important in sports. I've got two sons who are professional athletes, and as professional downhill mountain bike racers, where they look, and looking far enough down the road, is the biggest challenge in their racing and in their training. 
The reason is, if you look at the rocks and roots and stumps in front of you, you hit those and you don't get to where you want to go. As professional athletes, as professional racers, they have to look far enough down the road to see where they're going and then trust their training to see what's in front of them. They can actually see what is directly in front of them by simply looking down the road. I would argue that we need to do the same thing in our professional practice, especially for e-portfolios. If you want it to be a high impact practice, you've got to look far enough down the road to the context. Is it a real world activity? Does it provide the context that can actually make it a high impact practice? Are you helping your learners to connect the dots or are they simply gathering and collecting the dots and just stockpiling them as, as archives? The reason that this is important is that if we take a look at our current practice, what we do is focus on curriculum and standards. We all do this, right? We've got standards, we've got curriculum, whether it's governmental or organizational. This is the primary focus. This is how we begin. Once we sort of sort these details out, we then actually expend our focus to what our students, what our learners need to do. What is the knowledge? What is the skills? Where do we want them to go? What, what information are we going to deliver to them? Because that's the next step. The next step in that our focus is often focusing on that simple delivery of content. Delivery to the student. How do we get them the information? Some people would argue that problem has been solved with mobile technology. Focusing just on that content and the delivery isn't enough. Sometimes the student asks the questions, what is this for? Well, it's gonna help you to get into college. It's gonna help you with your credentialing. It's gonna help you for the next course. That's the authentic context or the real world context they get. But is that enough? Is that enough of a context to make a difference? I think all the pieces are in place for our e-portfolios. All the pieces are in place for real world learning. It's all there. All the pieces are there, curriculum standards, all this good stuff. Authentic context is also there, but I would argue that we need to step back a little bit. Step back far enough to see far enough down the road to see where we're going. Because if we step back far enough, we then can see what is, in, what is in front of us. And if we trust our ability to look far enough down the road, those rocks and roots, curriculum standards, delivery to the student, come into focus within that context of that real world, real world setting. That's the important part. If you use an e-portfolio or other authentic learning opportunities or real world learning opportunities, it becomes a context for real world growth. That label should be actually in the slide, by the way. <laughs> it is in the next one, I hope. Anyways, that's the context. And if you focus with real world uh, uh, learning opportunities, you're thinking about learner growth. And then the curriculum, then the standards, all these other things fall into place. That's backward design. That's actual backward design. Taking a look at where you want your learner to go, who do you want them to become, and designing the ePortfolio initiative across the entire program to get them there. We argue that our creating significant learning environments uh, perspective by using uh, choice, ownership, and voice through authentic learning opportunities is a way to get our learners there. Because delivering content to a learner, it didn't work 100 years ago when people proposed it, and I don't think it's gonna work today. Actually, we know it doesn't work today. It's extremely important that we shift our focus to giving our learners choice, ownership, and voice through those real-world authentic learning opportunities, and then that e-portfolio can become that genuine high-impact practice. This is what we're gonna be talking about at the SIG, uh, and as Mark had encouraged you all, we hope you will join us. Okay, so I'm going to cheat as well. I've got 15 slides, 20 seconds each, but I thought I'd be scientific because that equals 300 seconds. Okay, so it's sort of the same. My name's Patsy Polly. I'm from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and I've been asked, invited to lead the research hub at um, ABLE. And it's an interesting concept in that we already have a lot of these things in place. And what I'm going to do is run you through that. So that's me taking a photo of myself in flight and playing around with PowerPoint. So the technology is sort of interesting, but we have to think about whether we can research. Can we actually do this and what does it look like? I propose that we can because we've got a lot of the foundational things in place. 
So when we're thinking about ABLE as a brand, actually community is its strongest asset. And we are proud to be associated with ABLE and also the publications that um, sprout out of that organisation or are associated with it. But the concept of whether we can actually start to produce a book is another thing that we should be thinking about. So as community members, these cogs represent the foundational bits and I'm going to talk about the green, amber, red signalling that's used in project work for implementations. So we've got publications coming out as part of our resources in ABLE, but of course the community and the membership is very important. So in terms of what it all means, let's think about us as a community and build on the strengths. So we have a lot of the publications coming out, but how can we start to archive these and provide resources to the community? Well, the um, website is a very important portal for learning about this. So we need to cut across our university sector. We've started to do this by having these meetings um, on campus, which is very interesting. You get to meet all sorts of people and we need to, again, uh, make the organisation as the go-to place. Um, there are a lot of associations that are involved with ABLE already, but we need to strengthen these. We have global um, partnerships in terms of organisations that relate back to industry connections, as well as these university partnerships. For example, ePortfolios Australia counts uh, up a lot of um, universities that are research intensive and also education intensive. So that's also a very important thing to think about when connecting. Um, in terms of resources, the portal via the website will be very important. The field guide was a great start. Uh, we have to use the um, WordPress uh, portal as a chance to provide funding opportunities and also provide the types of um, publications that are out there and also other things. So funding opportunities, they're out there, but how do we get our hands on the money? So we have to actually know where they are and how to look for them and to present a case as research opportunities as, as research teams to, to start to um, try and get some of that done. So community, people investment, um, that's a very important concept. We have to start thinking about who our early career researchers are and build those people up in order to provide uh, inspiration and, and um, leadership that's ongoing. Um, we did collect survey data. It was not very interesting, to say the least. We needed more engagement. So I guess the next thing I'll be doing is grabbing you all um, at the drinks and tomorrow to ask you what you want to do, right? We don't have enough engagement at this point. And I guess putting out a survey is not the best way to do it. Um, so in orange or amber, we have the things that are under development and are out there but need strengthening. So the early career researchers, our shining light for the future, but also the concept of building research teams and drawing on our talent. So the talent profiling is very important and that's what we'll be trying to get forward and, and stronger tomorrow. In red, this is the part that's an emergency. We need to uh, address the concept of finding these research themes and that comes back to you as the community members and understanding what you would like to do, what you want to explore, what issues um, do you want to interrogate and, and have them as ongoing um, themes uh, as part of research teams and what do you need to do this. So tomorrow I'll be asking you to build up the wall of expertise with coloured post-it notes. Okay, so I thank you for your attention. Um, I am the last speaker, so at this point I think it's time to um, welcome any questions that you may have and also thank you for your attention. All right, let's give another hand to our Ignite, brave Ignite souls here. Okay, so not to stand between you and the drinks, <laughs> um, we do have time for a few questions for any of these fine folks up here uh, on the stage. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, yes, Paul. Time for drinks. <laughs> looking at some of the vendor topics, are you going to rely or look at some of the 
the work that was done with EduTools a number of years ago. And I know John Hiddleston and Helen and others were involved in some of that discussion. It's a good work. My, my reason for the question is whether or not you're aware of that or feel about some of that. That question was for me. Yes. I remember you mentioning it last year, and I have it written down. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question for Sarah Brown. Yes. Hello. Um, <laughs> what was your purpose in making the reflections only Yeah, so it just whipped right by it. It was supposed to be in there. Um, uh, I had noticed that the reflective elements in their final portfolio assignment seemed to be weaker than the other pieces. And um, so when I went back to do some, some lit review to try to figure out how I might strengthen it, like one of the tensions I found was that maybe it felt incoherent to them that that was the one text only assignment as part of the broader space. Um, but also I, I wanted it to feel like the low stakes part of a larger enterprise that they might have found to be new. And yet I still wanted it to feel, it's mission critical. Like that's what's gonna unpack some of their work for me. So that was the impetus between, between before trying to make this revision, which I didn't find to be the most successful. So, so going forward, would you move away from multi-modality towards something else in order to try to achieve goal? You know, when I write my autumn syllabus, I'll let you know. I mean, something. I think I want to still do something. Like there, there were some pieces that were good, but that, like what the grades showed me when I looked at that one piece of the rubric was that the the uptick there wasn't what I wanted it to be. Sorry, your, your students, is this their first encounter with reflective writing? Or do they have experience writing? So that, could, that could be a population um, factor. So I teach this freshman writing course, but because I have been teaching it online for the past couple of years, in fact, I just looked at my autumn roster and I have three of 23 are freshmen. The rest are upperclassmen, a lot of transfer students. So I don't know what they're coming in with. It's a much greater range than my colleagues who teach the same class. So what did, it, what did, you said some of them were good, what did, what did the good ones look like? Can you describe them? So the, the, I, I, think I put in like a couple that I felt were a successful implementation where it didn't feel like the reflection overtook the other, it felt like now the reflection was of a piece with the other work that they did in their portfolio. Coherent. Coherent. And what I was seeing in, in previous iterations and throughout, the, I've been teaching the class a few years now, was that the reflection just felt um, plunked in there. And so first I did the shift to revision, which helped. Um, but I, it still needs something more. And I'm not sure what that's going to be now. Okay, yeah, done. Question for Mark. I wonder if you take another run at the, uh, what you're talking about regarding the all things and examples. Can we figure out what you're getting at? Sure. Um, so I'm looking first at Sir Tim Berners-Lee and his concept of the semantic web. And his idea is that the web will be built semantically by using tags and by ABLE having its own controlled vocabulary or ontology of tags that we can draw upon, we can use the same tag for the same purpose once we have a, a defined list. And then people in New Zealand and people in Europe, people in North America and South America, then when they use a term in reference to an e-portfolio or a research project around e-portfolio and education, when they use those terms, then those documents or objects can be found on the semantic web by other interested people. So uh, the Pedagogies and Practices SIG is looking at creating this ABLE ontology, something that's particular to ABLE and ePortfolios. Okay. Oh, just how important is the open source component of that to you? Uh, when I think open source, I think, yay, like super good and super time-consuming. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if that's <laughs> Well, so I'm the only person crackers enough to take a stab at this. To me, it's very important. Um, what I see, especially amongst um, younger students that I work with, is they've already been to multiple institutions just finishing an undergraduate degree. 
and they have experience with multiple platforms. And to me, taking it out into the wilds, onto the semantic web, and having your own domain, you, you don't get locked up in these different platforms. Um, you can participate in the platform and then download that information and then you have your own repository to put it in. So it's not that you can't participate, but that you collect. And I'm also looking at adult learners and lifetime learning. Um, I'm most interested in that, especially as somebody who's moving into a completely different career, you know, late in life. And with the gig economy, as people go through different careers, by having this their own domain and their own database, they can collect all these things even as they go back for retraining. Well, um, it's uh, out of Australia, and it uh, is literally it comes from self-directed theory. So it's a combination of, of open education practices and self-directed theory. It's uh, in regard to adults and how they learn. Um, I'm trying to remember whose slide mentioned that uh, adults bring their experiences to the classroom if they're in a classroom or into whatever setting. And so with Hodagogy, that encourages you to bring your experiences in and then with ePortfolios you get to reflect on how your experiences interact with your current learning. If I may, what Mark is doing individually, all of our grad students in our program do as well. And they use their own domains, they, use, they choose their own software, and, and this is addressing the issue of vendors. We actually encourage them to use a self-hosted WordPress platform if they can. It's open source, it's often free, or if it is a cost, three or four dollars, they control it. We don't force users to you know, use a, an Android or an iPhone anymore. ePortfolios are ubiquitous now. And when you allow your learners, and we have our grad students all create an ePortfolio that it represents all their work and everything that we've talked about. And um, it's free, it's available, it's open. It makes a world of difference. So what Mark is doing individually, you can do it across an entire program and have wonderful success. Uh, Dr. Thibodeau and I just did a, our, our book and we made it available as an open educational resource. If you live OER and if you, you, you do the things, we give away all our videos, all our podcasts, all our ideas. If you, if you lead that way, well then your students pick that up and, and they give back. And I think it comes back many times over. Sorry. No, no, thank you. It's good. Any other questions? All right, if there are no more questions, I think there's uh, drinks awaiting us. And Tracy, I don't know if you want to say a few words. Sure, yeah. Um, so we hope you'll join us for the reception, which will be in a couple of, couple of our students' union lounge. Um, so we'll be sitting in the lounge. So basically, you go up the stairs to the second floor and follow the breezeway outside. It's just um, kind of to your right next to the pavilion that you could when you were sitting outside on the Thank <laughs> you.